Amazing. Um, okay, great. So I'm really happy to be here and I'm wearing many hats. I'm even wearing a road trip hat. I'm driving with my parents right now from Canada to Southern California. So at a certain point, my mom might come and tell me that I have to go now. Um, but I'm going to try to tell you as much about reproducible electrophysiology as I can um, before, before she comes in. So um, as Matteo alluded to, this is a super important point. So the life sciences have been experiencing a real crisis of reproducibility. This has been um, uh, described as a replication crisis as the field in psychology. And it's really extended to neuroscience as well, to the point where groups that aim to replicate each other's mouse behavioral results are unable to do so. They get different results on very simple behaviors from lab to lab, really casting doubt on how we can make general conclusions about brain function and about the link between brain and behavior uh, at all, if everybody's getting different results. And this has been a really hard problem to solve, in part because it's not clear where this experiment to experiment and lab to lab variability is coming from. And so the International Brain Laboratory decided that we were in a unique position to gain traction on this, on this problem. And we wanted to gain traction in two ways. First of all, by setting up a standardized, a standardized set of procedures, both for testing behavior and also for measuring neural activity um, in the hopes that we could um, uh, reduce lab to lab variability as a result of that standardization. And second of all, we were in a really good position to test whether or not that worked. And specifically, the reason for that is because in the IBL, um, as many of you know, what we are is a collection of multiple labs, uh, and there are about nine experimental labs that can collect data uh, in large quantities uh, and figure out where, whether we were successful in aiming to have um, reproducible experiments. And that is what I'm going to tell you about today. Okay, so this shows you the setup for the International Brain Laboratory uh, or IBL behavioral task, um, which you have probably heard some version of. Um, already in this course today, mice are making perceptual decisions about the spatial position of a grating, and they're reporting their decision about that spatial position by turning a wheel that moves the stimulus um, either to the left or to the right. So um, within the IBL, all of the behavioral labs adopted that task and came up with a standardized set of training procedures and required each mouse to really achieve a very specific set of behavioral uh, results before they were advanced to the next level. So before the mice were even considered candidates to, to participate in an electrophysiology experiment, they had to have very, um, a very clear behavior and to achieve many behavioral milestones. And so this is already a really good step to, um, to enhancing reproducibility because we make sure that all animals participating are in a relatively similar behavioral state. We have to be realistic in the sense that it's not going to be identical and even animals doing the same task has, have different strategies. But I think starting with the behavior and having a well-established set of criteria is an absolutely critical first step in achieving um, reproducible results. So the second thing that we did is this. So if you look on the upper right of the screen, you'll see a brain there with a red line and a bunch of other lines. And this is meant to schematize that as part of the IBL, we've been collecting data from all over the brain, aiming to generate a brain-wide activity map. And every single mouse that participates in a brain-wide activity map recording gets one neural pixels insertion in what we call the repeated site. And that's what you see in red there. It's uh, sort of fairly far back in the brain. You can see the coordinates there on the screen. Um, it's just anterior uh, to, to primary visual cortex, goes through um, what you might call visual area AM or posterior parietal cortex, if, so, if you're so inclined. Uh, then deeper down, it goes through CA1 and the dentate gyrus, and then LP and another uh, thalamic nuclei, nucleus. So that's where uh, the repeated site is, um, uh, aims to go. Uh, and each experimenter did an insertion in every mouse in that location. And as a result of this, we were able to get a large number, 91 to be exact, of attempted uh, insertions all in the same spot, putting us in a really unique position to, to see whether our attempts at reproducibility were successful, and moreover, to understand what leads to experiment to experiment and also lab to lab variability. So a really key part of this um, process is the post-mortem histological processing, because this allows us to see uh, where in the brain the electrode ended up. Uh, and this is really important. Um, so uh, each brain uh, is imaged uh, and then uh, traced and aligned so that we have an estimate of which brain regions every single neuron that we recorded is actually coming from. Um, you can see here some example brains. Um, the brains are green and the electrode tracks you can see there in yellow. Uh, 
Um, there are usually multiple yellow lines because each mouse usually has multiple electrode insertions. And then at the bottom there, you can see and see the spatial position of um, many of the uh, attempted insertions. It's a little hard for me to see all of these panels because the video is covering them, but that's probably not happening for you. Hopefully you can see the panels at the bottom of the screen really well. Uh, and what I hope is evident in C is that um, although all of the insertions were supposed to be where that yellow line is, they were not all exactly where they were supposed to be. Some of them were off a little bit one direction or the other. Some of them had a slightly different angle. Um, and uh, Stephen West, who was the, the lead on this, quantified that in D by looking at the difference between where the, uh, the insertion was supposed to be and where the um, uh, insertion actually end, ended up. So where the experimenter ended up putting the electrode. And so there's, yeah, you, you can see that it's not perfect. So even when 91 um, exper it, when in 91 experiments, we aim to do the same thing, we did not do the same thing. So why is that? Is this just because the experimenters like forgot the coordinates? No, the reason is um, twofold. The first thing is that sometimes um, as many of you, you will, if you don't know this, you'll know, learn it soon. If you wanna put an electrode in a particular spot, you might not be able to do that because there's a blood vessel there. So you'll have to, Scooch it, it's a natural thing to kind of scooch it one direction or the other because you don't want to hit the blood vessel. But the upshot of that is that you end up recording from a different spot from the one you intended to. So that was one thing that would, had happened. And the other thing that happened is that there are just some differences between an individual mouse and the average mouse that's used to generate the Allen Institute common coordinate frame. Um, so even uh, uh, if you do put the electrode exactly where it's supposed to go, if the mouse has a slightly smaller or slightly larger or just slightly different, more differently or shaped uh, brain than the Allen Institute brain, then you'll just end up going somewhere else. So those two factors together, the scooching of the electrodes and the heterogeneity of, of, of biology in the mouse brain meant that a lot of these insertions actually did not go where we wanted them to go. So we had a really strict criteria because uh, criteria we wanted to, to always be recording from the same place to really get at this issue of reproducibility. And uh, a lot of the insertions didn't make it. I'll tell you exactly how many um, later in the talk. Okay, so fortunately, um, a lot of insertions were successful and I've lined up um, a bunch of successful uh, insertions here. Um, and what you see on the left is a schematic of all the areas that these um, uh, insertions actually did go through and we verified that uh, with the histology. Um, and then you can see the power spectral density for each of the insertions um, there and uh, get the impression hopefully that they are pretty similar to each other. So the power spectral density, the LFP power is one feature of uh, an experiment that you can measure. You can always measure for every experiment. And there are a number of other, what you might call kind of basic response features that, that don't have anything to do with behavior that you can measure to get a sense of how similar they are across labs. And then you can, you, you can see whether there's any kind of significant difference across labs so that some tend to be outliers in terms of neuron yield or firing rate or, or, or whatever. Um, and look at all of those uh, in every brain area, um, do a test for the effect of lab ID um, for each of those features. So that's what you see in the upper right. That's a, a, a matrix that shows you for which of these features, neuron yield, firing rate, LFP power, RMS of the AP pand and spike amplitude, which ones of those were significant across labs and in which area. So at this moment with all of the data that we have, um, none of these are highly significant. There's a small impact, uh, it's non-significant. There is a small effect of LFP power uh, in area LP, the posterior lateral posterior nucleus of the thalamus, um, but it didn't reach significance. And you can see that for all of these other regions and these other um, firing rate metrics, none of them were significantly different across labs. Okay, so that's not the whole thing. There could still be um, experiment to experiment variability, and there is, I'm going to talk about that, but this was a first piece of kind of reassuring news that when we did everything in a really standardized way, we found that we got very similar results overall from uh, all of the labs that participated. And there's more data coming in on this um, as we collect more insertions, so the story may, may even evolve more. Okay, great. So then we decided to look um, not, not only at these features in a very general way, but as they related to task events. So for this analysis, we took advantage of the fact that we collected this data in a behavioral task and that we could look at features like firing rate, which you see on the left there, uh, as a function of time grouped by condition, where condition might be something like the contrast of the stimulus or whether the animal went left or right or whether it was a bias block or not. Uh, and then we can look at uh, the, uh, the, the firing rate 
as a function of time. And similar to the previous analysis, see whether there's any effect of lab ID, see whether we tend to get, in, in when you look in a task aligned way, different firing rate outcomes from different labs. Um, so that's what you see on the plot on the right. That's again, a permutation test across uh, labs. And on the uh, horizontal axis is time and the vertical axis now is p-value. So anytime you see a line that has a very, very small value, that means there was a significant effect across labs. Um, so, so the upshot of this plot is that overall, there was no, um, uh, uh, no area for which there was a significant effect across labs. Although you can see these p-values are kind of funky. There's clearly like some big changes that happen around the time of the movement. It's like everything is kind of reshuffled. Um, but but uh, nevertheless, there, there was no consistent effect of ID. Again, providing some assurance um, that, uh, that, that we are able to squelch some of these um, lab to lab effects that might tend to get in the way of reproducible uh, observations. OK, great. But nonetheless, even though we did, have not seen uh, really any significant effects of la lab ID, at least not any um, uh, very large ones, we do, do still see a lot of variability from experiment to experiment. And part of the reason why there tends to be no effect of lab ID is because the effect of, of um, just experiment to experiment variability is really high. So to put it another way, if you look at data from Yang Dan's lab, you get some high firing rates and some low firing rate experiments. And if you look at data from my lab, you get some high firing rate and some low firing rate experiments. So there's a lot of experiment to experiment variability. And so even though there's little lab to lab variability, there's still a lot of variance that we wanna explain, right? We wanna know why, why is it that one experiment is different from another? And so one hypothesis that's been um, uh, extensively tested, and this was led by uh, Marsa Tahari, who's a postdoc in my lab, is the possibility that um, one explanation for this variability comes from the spatial position of where the neurons were recorded. Okay, so for example, um, there's a nice example is shown on the left for area LP, that's the lateral posterior nucleus of the thalamus, and you can see it at the bottom, to me it looks a little bit like a sock, and it's a big sock. And one possibility is that maybe if you're recording from the ankle part of the sock, you tend to get higher firing rates. And if you're recording from the toe part of the, the sock, you get lower firing rates. And this would mean that even if an, uh, a particular insertion um, passed the quality control and really was an LP, you still might see experiment to experiment variability depending on where an LP you measured. Uh, so yeah. Sorry, there's a question that I think you could answer right away to clarify from sure. Victoria asks, if are you when you talk about effects from different labs did you consider only one mouse per lab or were there was there more than one and i think the answer is more than one right yeah thanks for the clarification on that yeah so a lab was only included in that test if it had uh, four or more successful insertions so then the way that the test works is you look at the within lab variability and compare that to the across lab variability so at the moment, actually, it's for, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, at, at the moment, there are a few labs that aren't included because they didn't have enough insertions for us to estimate the, uh, the within lab variability. And it's that comparison that's really key for the test. Okay, so, so back to LP. Yeah, thanks for that. So back to LP. Um, so we did find that there were a number of outliers in firing rate. So if you look at the plot on the upper left, um, the, the coordinates are just like space is just space. Uh, and the, the um, circles there show you the firing rate of a neuron in that area. Um, and you can see that there are a few outliers in firing rate. There are some neurons that tend to have a really high firing rate. And that does. there's a little bit of a hint that some of them are clustered over to that kind of um, lateral region of, of LP, um, although that was sort of a, a, small, a small effect. Um, one thing that benefited this approach is that we have now almost a thousand neurons in area LP, which means we're really getting enough statistical power. Um, still aren't quite sure whether there's a spatial effect, but you can see there are starting to be hints of one. So maybe part of the reason you see variability from experiment to experiment is because even if you really are in the right place and have really strict standards for that, it still can be a place where there's heterogeneity across the area in terms of what the neurons do. Um, this tended to be less true in the in the PPC on the surface of the brain. Um, for there, it, it, I would say that the, the high firing neurons tend to be a little more evenly distributed. Uh, okay, so then in addition to looking at um, things like the magnitude of firing rate, we examine things like the selectivity of cells for um, predicting, uh, sorry, preferring like left choices versus right choices. 
Um, we've also looked at the Fano factor and are also starting to find that for the most part, the selectivity of those neurons is not explained by their position in the area, suggesting um, that the position in the area, although probably a minor contributor to experiment to experiment variability, doesn't really account for, uh, for all of it. Okay, um, so the final analysis um, that I'll tell you about is that we built a, a multitask neural network um, to try and predict the firing rate of each neuron based on a whole bunch of features that we have in our experiment. And these are things like um, uh, the, the motion energy, that's the first derivative of the video, the wheel velocity, the mouse's pupil, the state that the mouse was in, all sorts of things. We just take each neuron and try to predict its firing rate based on all of these um, behavioral uh, regressors. And we can look at both of the, this is slightly technical, but both the impact of those um, variables one at a time and also in a much more conservative way called the leave one out analysis where you omit a variable and look at how much worse the performance of the model is. How, how much worse the model is in like predicting the firing rates of the, of the neurons in there. Um, this is still an emerging analysis, um, but overall that we found uh, that lab ID does not have a significant effect even in our very conservative analysis. So to put that another way, knowing which lab a neuron was recorded from does not give you more explanatory power in figuring out um, all, of its, uh, all of its single trial responses. So that's reassuring. Um, uh, we, we found that the variables that had the biggest impact as in previous studies were things like the motion energy from the video. Again, highlighting that the, the movements the animal makes, not all, the, not all of which are carefully tracked because um, you often don't think to track them, uh, tend to contribute a lot to, to explain a lot of, of single trial variance. Okay, so um, uh, one outcome that we hope to have sort of as a, as a closing thought from all this approach, all of this work is that we'd really like to come up with some quality control metrics that we can share with the field. And maybe as a field, we can come to agree that if we're gonna collect electrophysiological during behavior, that we're gonna agree on these particular quality standards, um, or at least someone could opt to agree to those. And that would make it really much easier for different groups to make comparisons across the data that they're collecting in, uh, in, in rather different contexts. Uh, so for example, having a minimum number of behavioral trials, um, uh, for, for us, having at least three regions hit by the, um, uh, by, by the probe, um, and then have some agreed upon metrics for what constitutes a good unit, such as a mean amplitude of the, the unit, an agreed upon noise cutoff, an agreed upon value for refractory period violations. Um, and if you look on the right for these failure points, this shows you how insertions were eliminated from our analysis. And you can see we lost a lot of data, right? We did start with 104 insertions and we ended up with only including 39 of these for analysis. The biggest place where we lost insertions was at the level of, of the insertion quality control. So just making sure the electrode ended up in the right place. But we also lost a lot for other reasons too, behavior, histology, and so on. So I don't know what the take home is from this, except that, that if, if groups are not doing this quality control, they're going to have rather different data sets from groups that are doing the quality control. And I think the path forward is still emerging. But one thing is clear is that if we don't agree upon some standards, we're going to have some highly heterogeneous data sets. OK, so, so uh, to wrap up, um, uh, we implemented uh, a cross lab standardization of electrophysiology procedures, many of them uh, all the way from the surgery to the behavior to the, to the data processing. Um, we were able to achieve uh, reproducible results across lab. We still saw what you might call failures of reproducibility for a couple of reasons, uh, driven by deviations in insertion locations. Um, these can be fixed in part by refinements in stereotaxic procedures, um, but there are still variants remaining that we still don't understand. So I think it's going to be fun to dig deep and get a better understanding of what kind of experiment to experiment variability is persisting and what accounts for it. So overall, these repeated site recordings allow for quantification of reproducibility of targeting, physiology, and function, uh, and we hope a better understanding of sources of uh, neuronal variability. Um, so big thanks to the IBL, to all the people that collected this data, and especially the people on the Reproducible Electrophysiology Task Force. And I'd love to hear any questions or, or suggestions that folks have. Thank you, Ann. So there's 197 people in here and you can't see them, but they're clapping. And uh, um, I'll, you're perfectly on time. And I think there's time to answer both questions in there, both from Joe Wexelblatt. Um, the first one is what prompted the choice of the repeated site versus other possible penetrations? 
Yeah, I think we 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 chose the repeated site location for a few reasons. Um, partly, it was in a place that's pretty easy to access. Um, uh, it's a site that you'd be able to achieve no matter whether you're planning other insertions to go more anterior or more posterior. Because remember, the people collecting this data are doing this in the context of making insertions elsewhere as part of the brain wide map. Uh, and it was also an, an appealing site because it was going through a lot of areas that have fairly well established response properties and tend to be heavily studied in the field. So it seemed like we could put our results in the context of other studies more easily, since there are a lot of studies that are targeting um, these areas. Nick, I don't know if it, you want to add anything to that. I think you were part of the decision about where to um, where to to put the repeated site. Yep. No, I think you got it. That's what I would have said. Okay. All right. The next two questions actually are addressed in our e life paper about behavior. Um, and so maybe I'll skip to the third, to the one from Soraya. Uh, where are all these in head fixed mice? Are you planning to extend to freely moving? Yeah, these are all in head fixed mice, although it, it would be in principle quite feasible to do in freely moving and would be really important to really important to do the experiment to experiment variability could either be greater or less uh, with freely moving it's it's hard to say I think the one thing that would make it challenging is that usually in a freely moving setup. You kind of put one or maybe a few electrodes in and then you kind of hold them in place and that's it you're done. So I think um, I would love it if somebody would do that experiment, but I think it would be harder to do in the context of other kinds of recordings the way that we did here. So, well, sorry, I thought I just need, so <laughs> excuse me. So anyway, I think it would be a little harder to do because you have a little less flexibility in terms of where you put electrodes, but it would be great to see uh, super important. 